Hello and welcome to Philosophy 1009, Ethics and Society, Module 1A. Module 1A is the course breakdown, the course content, and the academic requirements for students to fulfill in order to graduate. So what I'd like to do here is basically sort of break down all this material and start by telling you, first of all, who I am. My name is Edward Matthews. I have an MA and a PhD and I teach at the School of Language and Liberal Studies in A2003. And as you well know, the school is open, but this course is taught exclusively online. Uh, if you need to get hold of me, and do not hesitate if you have to, I can be reached at emmatthews at fanshawonline.ca. Now, my academic background is varied, but it is uh, certainly more than sufficient to teach this course properly because my primary focus is on social and political thought and continental philosophy. And what that means is philosophy primarily from Western Europe. Now, I also have a very strong interest in social anthropology, which is where our uh, class on cultural relativism will be about and is coming from. I've also been studying feminist theory and gender studies. Uh, in my undergraduate work, I did film theory and production, although judging by this video, it's pretty poor in, in grade school level, but it's going to get better, hopefully. Uh, I also have a very strong interest in psychoanalysis. And finally, literary theory, linguistics, and semiotics. Semi semiotics is the study of signs. Uh, in other words, the use of colors, uh, breaking down a, a, a photograph or a painting and pointing out certain uh, messages that are being broadcasted to, indiv to individuals without us really knowing why. So semiotics is a study of how this is done. Not important for ethics and, and, uh, and ethics in society, but still very fascinating. Okay, so what I want to do is break down, first of all, the vocational learning outcomes. And there's six of them. Now, what I'm going to do is sort of very briefly give you a kind of a background on each of these vocational learning outcomes, but I'm going to go into more uh, more uh, in-depth analysis as we go through the weekly course content. So the first one is critique the arguments presented by cultural relativists and ethical egoists. Now, what are those? A cultural relativist is a person who believes that no one society is better than another. In other words, no one person's uh, way of life is better or worse than another. Uh, this is important when we are looking at uh, remedies to against racism, for example, the fact that somehow one society views their way of life and the way they behave and the way they perceive themselves as better than others. This is one way to knock that down. Uh, it's also a way to knock down what's called Eurocentrism, the notion that sort of Western Europe is the cradle of civilization, uh, when in fact it's a, a civilization amongst many others. And of course, historically, civilizations go back at least 5,000 years. So yeah, no one uh, world or no one society is better than another. So we need to look at that in terms of uh, ethical behavior and moral value systems. Now, the other one is an ethical egoist. And an ethical egoist is an individual who believes that no matter what we do, we are always thinking of ourselves first. Even if to others we appear to be selfless and altruistic, in other words, other directed, uh, whether it's holding a door open for someone or helping someone out, giving someone, you know, your spare change uh, that are, they happen to be homeless. At the end of the day, there are people who believe that we're doing this because we want to sleep at night. We want to have a clear conscience. So the act may benefit another person, but ultimately our motivation is to benefit ourselves, even if it's our own conscience. So we'll look at whether or not this is a sound idea uh, and as well present arguments for and against it. So this is kind of the work we're going to be doing in this class. Now, the second one is to understand the, the value of utilitarianism and deontology and then applying those positions to contemporary moral debates, which, as you will see when you finish this course, that these two positions are primarily the the two most important ones, the two main ones that we that we see over and over again. Now, again, briefly, utilitarianism is the notion that the greater good is what matters. So here we are. Uh, I'm at I'm at home presenting this or putting this video together for you to watch. You really can't come to school unless you have permission and you wear a mask and you socially distance. 
etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All the things we've had to do since the middle of March have been utilitarian. In other words, those actions, however uncomfortable or inconvenient or just not nasty, but just uh, sometimes uncomfortable, those actions are being asked by society, by policy planners, for us to follow through for society to survive. And we're seeing that even now, some people are just kind of getting tired. They get they have COVID fatigue, for example. So they're not so careful about wearing a mask or socially distancing. And sure enough, we have an uptick in the number of cases. So policy planners primarily are utilitarian because they wish to consider the greater good of society above all else. But it may mean sometimes an inconvenience for us. But that's the way it is. Now, a deontologist is someone that looks at actions, whatever they may be, and says, I'm going to do the same thing all the time. So how does that compare with utilitarianism? Well, if you are worried about utility or thinking of utility, you're thinking about the consequence of the action. In other words, if I socially distance and I wear a mask, then I will be performing my duty as a, as a social citizen and helping society. Now, let's say for argument's sake, under bizarre circumstances, utilitarians asked us to lie regularly. A deontologist would say, no, absolutely not. I don't want to lie because it's wrong in and of itself. And I don't want to set a precedent so that I begin lying for this small little reason. And the next thing you know, I begin lying more and more. And the, at the end of the day, you end up lying constantly. Well, who's going to trust you? How will you trust another person who is speaking to you? to wonder whether they're telling you the truth. So the difference between these two positions, between utilitarianism and deontology, is that utilitarians think of the consequences more so than the actions. A deontologist thinks exclusively about the action and not so much about the consequence. The action must be right. Utilitarians, not so much. They're more concerned with the consequence. So as you can imagine, uh, issues like capital punishment, um, the use of state-sponsored uh, uh, torture against terror suspects, a whole range of moral debates hinge on these two positions, and they become very, very important in trying to uh, stake out a certain point of view on, a, on an issue, uh, a contemporary issue. And let's face it, these days, there are lots of them. So we're going to look at that very carefully. But keep in mind that right now, these terms are very new, but you will become very familiar with them as time goes on because they are the two most important ones that you will experience and, uh, and, and sort of see at work in moral debates. Okay. The third one is to discuss whether or not one's rights can be violated, violated if the consequences are good enough. So again, to refer back to utilitarianism, uh, is this something that, that is worth considering? Uh, okay. So, some people, some individuals believe that wearing a mask is an infringement of their human rights. And this is, again, right now, very important because we see in the States that wearing a mask has become a political issue. And that's what it means. It means that wearing a mask becomes a uh, the center of a debate over uh, human rights, political rights, freedoms. Uh, and cer certainly they are important. But if you are utilitarian, then that the consequences are that society will survive. You must wear that mask. Otherwise, you could be asymptomatic and you can make someone sick without even without even realizing, without even wishing to. But because you you're not showing symptoms, you're passing off the virus to others. So if someone's rights are violated, it depends, of course, what they are. I mean, incarceration is a violation of of a human right. But if the person has just killed three people, then that is more than good enough. So there is a balance between the actions and whether or not the consequences are, as they say, good enough. Do, do they match up? Do they balance up? So again, very important depending on which, uh, which debate we're discussing. And we have a range of them uh, in this course. Uh, another one is to evaluate theories that attempt to, to move beyond utilitarianism, right? To transcend utilitarianism and deontology. Uh, this would include an ethics of care or virtue ethics. Uh, ethics of care is 
an idea that is fairly recent in the history of morality because morality discussions around these ish, uh, these ideas are at least 300 years old. But an ethics of care is something that was introduced uh, in, through the feminist world by uh, people like Carol Gilligan, who believed that that women by not necessarily by their nature, but by their social, um, they're not the, what's the word here? Their social upbringing. They are more prone to understanding ethics of care where you don't worry so much about the, the, the entire universe, the entire globe, but think more locally. So think about helping the homeless community in your immediate area. I mean, homelessness is a, is a very serious problem. Um, uh, the, the level of meth, methadone addiction or fentanyl addiction is a huge problem. But an ethics of care would say, look, I'm going to start in my neighborhood. I'm going to start with the people I see and know, and I'm going to work from there. So an ethics of care uh, is a very sort of grassroots, local kind of idea. Uh, that also extends to the environment. You're going to clean up your immediate area, your neighborhood. And so... And ethics of care is not high-minded so much as it is concerned with your immediate surroundings. And that doesn't mean that you stop caring about someone that, you know, uh, uh, someone living in, in another part of the world that could be poor or disenfranchised or without, without any kind of options and opportunities. But you start, you start locally. You can think globally, but you start locally. Uh, virtue eth ethics is an idea that belongs to Aristotle, uh, who was writing in roughly 300 BC. And vir virtue ethics is this notion that uh, we should make good citizens based on what we consider to be virtuous behavior. Uh, courage, uh, honesty, these are virtue virtues that we would expect other people to have and we certainly would like to abide by them ourselves. But we make, we make a, a good community, a strong community, if each one of us tries to be virtuous in some way as opposed to an excess or deficiency. Let's say, for example, uh, courage. An excess of courage would be foolhardiness. In other words, not thinking about the dangers inherent in a particular situation. And you either race up to the top of the hill to, you know, to go and fire at the enemy or run down a dark alley because you've heard a noise. That's, that's being foolish. You're not being cur courageous. You're being foolish here because you're not thinking about the situation. The opposite, it's to not do anything at all, right? So a deficiency is to simply be a coward and not do anything at all. So virtue ethics and a, a virtuous behavior is that midpoint, the midpoint between something like cowardice, a deficiency, or foolishness, which is a, a an excess form of behavior. So virtue ethics, is, as old as it is, is still remarkably robust as a as a moral viewpoint because Virtuous behavior is something that we've, we've wanted to have for thousands of years, and we still do. So it's worth looking at. So the next one is to understand the historical foundations of the social contract theory, right? And its relationship to liberty and freedom of speech and freedom of assembly and movement. Again, the social contract theory, who would have thought that in 2019 and 2020, that it would become really important because Again, many of the debates around wearing a mask um, and self-isolation and social distancing, this is all brought about by this, this, and again, this is a fiction, the social contract theory. I didn't sign one, you didn't either, but we have an idea in our heads about how society should work. So we have a, a kind of contract with, with our, our neighbors, our community, our city, our, our province, et cetera, et cetera, and it radiates out. But that social contract is this notion that we will we will behave well, we will trust our our fellow person, we will engage with them, we will help them, because we would like to be able to to live in such a way that we don't have to fear harm, we don't have to fear being murdered because we own something that somebody else wants. Now, the social contract has not stopped uh, theft or murder or other forms of criminal behavior, but it has probably stopped some people because we have a legal system in place that will make you think twice about doing something like that. Now, uh, this again, in a very broad sort of way, we will look at this in depth, but I just want you to understand the, the foundations of the social contract come from this, again, this other fiction 
of something called a state of nature. And the state of nature is a kind of world where it's, uh, if you're a follower of Thomas Hobbes, it is a war of all against all. And we have a situation where it's dangerous. It is dangerous. You cannot protect yourself, your family, your loved ones, your, your, your stuff, right? Because it's not even property. It's just your stuff at this point. And we enter into a social contract by giving up the possibility of retaliating against someone who has wronged us in some way. And we give that up to a third party. We give that up to a government, to a king, to elected representatives. And they are the ones that will help us to, to correct uh, uh, a wrong that's been done against us. That's why people sue one another, why we have a court system, why we have laws. All of those are based on the foundation of a social contract that we engage in, we enter into when we decide to, to live in a certain place. So uh, we're going to look at that, the foundations of it, where it comes from, because it is a, a fairly ancient idea, roughly the 1600s, the late 1600s, and especially its relationship to liberty and freedom of speech, because not only are we able, once we enter the, into this contract, to feel free, because now we don't have to worry about who's going to harm us, but we should also have the ability to speak out if something isn't right. In other words, the government is excessively harsh in, in punishment. We should reserve the right to speak out. Uh, the Black Lives uh, Movement is, uh, Black Lives Matter is exactly that. It is pushing back on the social contract where laws in the U.S. have been designed to discriminate. And these are laws passed by individuals, uh, usually by white men, but these are laws passed by individuals to continue to discriminate against a group of people simply because of the color of their skin. So the Black Lives Matter movement is a push against the way in which a social contract can sometimes harm others. So these, all these issues are very, very important. And then finally, the last one is, as you can see, I've been discussing all kinds of different ideas uh, related to this course. But each time I've tried to defend a position in a moral debate with careful reasoning. That's not easy. The first year I taught this course, I remember a student putting up her hand and saying, well, sir, that's great, but that's not easy to do. Absolutely. It is not easy to do. Uh, we have individuals that are coming after us on social media, especially Facebook, and especially in the U.S. right now with an election coming up very shortly, that people are out there ready to push our buttons, push our buttons about uh, immigration, about uh, lawlessness, about a whole range of things. And that's not careful reasoning. That's a simply pushing our buttons. And uh, this is this is what's now called post-truth. Now, truth would be reason and objectivity, but post-truth is zeroing in on someone's emotional response to get them to think a certain way, right? I'm gonna push your buttons, and I'm gonna get you really mad about something, so you're not thinking carefully. Now, how does this relate to morality and ethics? It does in this way. When we are discussing, let's say something like capital punishment, or the use of uh, torture on terror suspects, there is a tendency to slip into emotional language because it is a passionate subject. And many of these debates are, for example, uh, the right to die, right? Uh, euthanasia. These are very passionate discussions and passionate subjects that people wish to discuss, but we have to do it in a way that is respectful and that uses careful reasoning. And you can do that by relying on some of these positions that I've already discussed, utilitarianism, deontology, ethical egoism, cultural relativism. These are all isms and positions that you can use in order to debate in a reasonable fashion and make the debate such that people are going to actually listen to you. Because the last thing you want to do is start screaming past someone because all people are doing these days are simply shouting past each other and no one's really hearing much of anything. So that is a list of vocational learning outcomes. Don't worry if they don't make sense right now. We're going to be using these things on a weekly basis in our modules and our discussions in the quizzes and your papers and so on. So you'll have a chance to understand more fully what these various terms actually mean. So the method of evaluation here, uh, pretty straightforward. There will be online quizzes. And before we end this video, I'm going to show you where that information is. There's a short essay worth 15%, a longer essay worth 25%, and there will be two tests. 
Now there'll be a midterm and a final test. Now, uh, I like, don't like to call them exams. That's It causes fear in a lot of people. Uh, they're tests. And the first one will cover the first half of the course and the second test, simply the second half of the course. So once you finish the first half and you have your midterm, uh, rest easy. This kind of material will not come up in the second uh, test at the end of week 13. So they're basically cumulative for the first half and the second half of the course. And hopefully my math is right and it does total up to 100%. As you, as I pointed out, I'm a philosopher, not a mathematician. So I want to make sure that is in fact correct. So quizzes, short and longer essay, and two tests. So what are the quizzes? Uh, there, there are going to be four online quizzes worth a total of 20 for the final grade. And the quizzes will be a combination of things. I think for the most part now, I've just done true and false. It just makes it quicker. Um, and each one of them, there might be 10 or 12 questions. So it's basically uh, a quick review. And the reviews are, are useful because of the fact that they are uh, questions that will be very similar to the midterm and the final. So uh, mostly true and false. Uh, some short answer questions right now, but you will have four of them. And it, mark this. Only the top three marks will count towards your final grade. So you will write four of them, but only the top three, the computer will read as the best marks. So if you happen to miss one or the first one, you bomb completely and you get two out of 10. I hope not, but let's say you did. Don't panic. Don't panic, please. The next three will give you more than, more than enough opportunity to bring your mark back up. So of the four, only three will be marked towards your final grade. Now the shorter essay, uh, this is an assignment worth 15%. And again, I will show you an FOL where that is. And this is uh, an opportunity for you to sort of understand more carefully some of the debates that we will have been looking at over the first, say, three or four weeks. And it gives you a chance to, to develop your uh, skill as a writer, and especially as an argumentative writer. Uh, now, you have a list of topics to choose from, and they all are coming, generally speaking, from the first half of the course. Uh, and the essay will be about two to three pages. So that's roughly six to eight hundred words. So some people like how many pages, some others, other students ask in you know, how many words, but say two to three or between six to eight hundred words. So I think the first time around, that should be plenty of room for you to unpack an idea. And when you are discussing your your particular uh, idea, the best thing is in order to make it reasonable and objective and fair, because this is important and we will talk about this later, but we'll just mention it here. A way in which to develop your argumentative writing style is to present the opposing viewpoint first. Now, why is that useful? It is because you now present the side that you disagree with. Now, you don't have to tell me that you disagree with it because as a reader, I'm going to start reading through this material and say, okay, uh, this a student wants to look at uh, euthanasia and wants to look at it from a utilitarian point of view. I don't know. But here's what presenting the opposing or the, the side you don't agree with, might, what makes it more effective? It does this. I start reading this, this first section, and and write it as if you did believe it. Now, the second half of your paper, now when you go and knock down the argument, you don't have to rewrite the whole thing. You have already discussed the point of view that you wish to to debate and and uh, and basically say is wrong, and you've already presented that. It makes writing much more effective. And guess what? When I'm done reading that essay, the last thing I'm thinking about is your point of view your correct assessment of a situation. So that's why writing it like that is a very uh, effective way to present a reasonable argument because it has to be reasonable and present both sides. But you're doing it in such a way that I now see where you're coming from. And I see presented the side that you wish to disagree with, but you've you've given them their, their moment, right? You've given them their time and said, okay, now, uh, having said that, I, then you start to knock down the debate or at least the, the position that, uh, that is in that particular debate. So it isn't a very effective way to do it. Now, the longer essay, you, as you can see, is 25%, and it's a little bit longer, 800 to 1,000 words. And it's, again, the, the same sort of thing, 
right? It's a, a, a chance for you to refine your writing skills uh, and you wish to apply in this particular case, the position that we will have been discussing for the most part in this course, which is utilitarianism and deontology. And once again, the same thing, you have a choice of topics. Now, having said that, if you choose to pick something different, like let's say you have an idea, for example, for example, what if you wanted to talk about the debate over wearing masks in public and you take the position of someone that thinks it's an infringement on the human rights? You would have to argue very reasonably and persuasively to me that wearing a mask is an affront on your individual rights. And again, that is your position. It is not right or wrong. But what happens is you need to persuade me that it's correct. Now, I'm not going to tell you where I stand on certain things because that's not important. But what I want you to do is persuade me. Now, I have my own opinions about things, but if you can persuade me that your position is correct and you debate it effectively and you debate it reasonably and with, you know, balance, uh, you will get full marks. So don't, uh, <clears throat> don't try to second guess wh where I stand on a certain thing. Sometimes it becomes pretty obvious because I cannot be, uh, dispassionate over certain things. Some things really piss me off. And if they do, you'll know about it. But even if you disagree with me, disagree persuasively, because I am open to being swayed. If you present your, your ideas in a very compelling way, a persuasive way, in a reasonable way, and reasonable is not balanced, that's fine. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, I mentioned the online tests. There will be the midterm dealing with the, car, the material in the first half and in the second for the second half. And it for sure will be a combination of true-false questions There'll be identify and explain questions, five short answer questions, and one essay question. Now, uh, what do I mean by identify and explain? There will be uh, a number of terms that we're going to experience as we go through the course material. Uh, for example, utilitarianism or um, social contract. So identify and explain, and they're only worth three marks. So it's very, it's not, uh, you know, 20 or 30, it's three. So, uh, you will have a choice. Usually I give students a choice of about 15, and I'd like you to pick five, just five. Now that gives you a chance to sort of just by, by our human nature, certain things we connect with more strongly than, than other things. Those individual things you will remember. So as you learn the material, if some parts of it you're not 100% sure, there will be some, some leeway. There will be some options. Now, true, false, it's 50-50, right? It's either T or F. Identify and explain, you've got some choices there. Uh, short answer questions, they're also very brief. They're also out of three, and they're pretty straightforward. And usually the essay question and the word essay freaks a lot of students out, but don't worry. You will have a choice there again. Usually when I have an essay question, I have a minimum three different options, and you write only one. So let's say identify and explain, you answer five out of 12 or 15, uh, and the true, false, and the short answer questions, please answer, please answer all of them. But the essay question, you'll have a choice. So it does make it more fair. So when are these things due and when do they come up? So online quizzes will be at the end of weeks four, six, nine, and in this case, normally 13, it'll be at the end of week 12. So that will need to change. Uh, short answer, uh, sorry, short essay will be at the end of week five. And I would like you to look at the drop box for the due dates. The longer essay at the end of week 11, also check the due date on the drop box. And this year, the test will be at the end of week six and at the end of week 13. So there is a final, but the final is not during weeks 14 and 15, which is what we normally have, but within week 13. And the, one of the last classes I will do is a review of the material for the second half, but I will also do the same thing for the first quiz as well, oh, sorry, the first test uh, at the end of week six. So um, here's a brief overview of what we're gonna be looking at here. We'll go through these fairly quickly because it's already at 29 and a half minutes almost. So where are we at right now? We are doing the course introduction and academic requirements. And so that's module A and module B, 1B is the beginning. What is morality? What is ethics? Now, very briefly, morality is the value system that we hold within us. That is a value system we've learned either from our parents, 
from our members of our family, uh, our religious affiliation, whatever that may be, the community in which we live. You may have uh, belonged to Girl Guides or Boy Scouts or some other organization like that. Uh, you might even play on a team because teamwork is also something that uh, rolls into proper social living rather easily. So we're going to ask ourselves, what is morality, the value system, and what is ethics? Ethics is the expression of that value system. So if you believe that that being honest with people is really important because you are a deontologist, for example, then that is your value system. It is expressed ethically by you not lying to people, not taking advantage of them, not using them as a, a, an individual as a means to an end. So we will look at those two terms. We're going to unpack them and define them, and then we're going to see them in action. Uh, this is the, this usually is, I like to call it go, diving to the deep end of, uh, of morals and ethics because they're pretty tough classes in the sense that if you are an early childhood education uh, student, um, these, these uh, examples are going to hit home, but they are very, very good in defining these two positions that we're going to look at over and over again, utilitarianism and deontology. So week two, uh, or modules 2A and 2B. Now again, uh, each of the modules will have their own video. This is usually a one hour, uh, one hour class and the other one for uh, 1B, 2B will be slightly longer. But again, it used to be an hour and 40 minutes. Let's see how long it takes us to, for us to finish up in a video. Uh, week two, the cast the question, why be moral? What difference does it make? Well, it makes a big difference because if you're not uh, a big believer in telling the truth, uh, eventually society begins to break down because we don't believe you anymore. People don't believe each other. They don't trust each other because the issue of trust is when really when you think about it, very important because when you are ready to cross the street, even though the green, the light is green, you have to trust oncoming traffic that they're going to not only see the green light, that they're going to stop because there could be somebody on their cell phone, somebody rummaging around, you know, something just fell off their, the passenger side uh, seat and it's, you know, it's down on the floor. You don't know, but you have to trust people. And sure, there are laws in place, but there are a lot of things that people do where we need to trust one another. And if we're allowed to lie to each other, that trust begins to erode and we're not so willing to, um, to believe in other people. For example, some of you, maybe not this year, but when you enter into a contract with a, let's say with a landlord to rent their basement or a room in their house or an actual apartment, you hope that when you come home after being at school all day, that not only is your furniture still there, your food's still there, the door, the lock hasn't been changed on the door, you have to trust the landlord. So why be moral? Because if we're not, society begins to break down. That's kind of the short answer. So module 2B, we look at cultural relativism. And I mentioned very briefly what that was, uh, the notion that uh, a society cannot turn around and say that it is better than another simply because they live in a certain part of the world or they're rich or they're white or they're whatever. So cultural relativism is this notion that one society is not better than another. It simply is different. What are those differences and how do those differences expressed as an ethical form of behavior, how does that va uh, factor into their moral value system? You'll be surprised. People behave very differently around the world, but we seem to share for the most part <clears throat> the same value system. Okay, week three, uh, psychological and ethical egoism. The difference between these two, psychological egoism is this notion that we are hardwired to always be selfish. Ethical egoism is we we rationalize being selfish. We rationalize doing things to benefit us. And we'll see just how valid those two positions are because at the end, at the end of the day, they, they're difficult to maintain. So, uh, right before we even start, yes, the two of them, uh, are ideas that have been discussed over a period of time, but ethical e egoism, the, the idea that we do things because deep down it makes us feel good. It's, it's difficult to prove that, but we'll look at it. Uh, the plight of world poverty is very important because world poverty is something that continues to exist, perhaps now made even worse by the fact that globally we have a pandemic where people have not been able to work and the poor have just simply become poor in certain parts of the world. In Canada, we've been extremely lucky. 
we haven't had the same level of impact that we've had in even in the states where the money coming from the government it just stops and people are literally on their own the government is utterly utterly incapable of helping their citizens it's pretty sad but in terms of world poverty uh what do we do what do we do about trying to solve that particular problem can we do something that would make a difference on any kind of level so we're going to look at that uh, week four, we're going to spend both modules, A and B, looking at utilitarianism because it is important. We need to define uh, what it is, its history, how it's changed over a period of time, and what it means today to be a utilitarian. Week five, we're going to look at the opposite, right? Deontology, or what uh, Immanuel Kant called the categorical imperative. This notion that it is categorical, uh, it's going to be applied every time and it is imperative. You must do this. So it is the notion that we have a duty to act in a certain way for society to continue to function. So we will look at that in greater detail, and then we're going to apply it to the war on drugs, or in the case, uh, depending where you live, the failure of the war on drugs. And of course, war on drugs now isn't just weed, because in, in Canada it's legal, but even the, the massive scourge of fentanyl, the, the over uh, prescription or uh, over prescribing of fentanyl and uh, highly addictive medications for people who uh, didn't ask to become addicted, to become hooked on these drugs. What are we going to do? So the war on drugs is uh, a good example where we can look at these two positions of deontology and utilitarianism. Uh, week six, we're going to again look at another very serious matter. In this case, it's going to be euthanasia. And uh, also in the second half, I want to take a take time to do a brief sort of um, uh, review of the material from the first five weeks, because we'll have the first online test based on weeks one to six. Test base is not one word. It's forgot to put a space uh, based on the weeks one to six. So this is where the first half of the course will come, will finish and we will have our, our midterm test. Week seven. We start into the social contract theories, and as you can see, week seven and eight will be devoted to social co social contract theories uh, by Thomas Hobbes, by John Locke, by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, by John Stuart Mill. And along with those, we're going to look at examples of how the social contract works. Because when you think about it, uh, issues around capital punishment are probably some of the most difficult aspects of the social contract. And what I mean by that is it is uneven. The state reserves the right in certain in certain states in the US and around the world, um, in China, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and other countries that still have capital punishment. We enter into a contract with a government agency, the state, that we allow them to put us to death if we commit a certain type of crime. Uh, a federal crime, a capital offense, we reserve the right to allow them to put us to death, incarcerate us, yes, but to kill us. That is, that's a tall order. So is that legitimate? So the, the issues around capital punishment are going to be looked at because, as I say, they're one of the most serious examples of the social contract. Many people believe that it's a good thing, right? Let's, they deserve to die as opposed to well, let's uh, let's step back and see. Okay, um, is it effective? Is it is it fair? Does it seem to uh, affect more one type of person versus another? So those things we're going to look at as a as serious example of the social contract. In the second one, in week eight, we'll return to the social contract theories of Rousseau and Jean, Jean uh, sorry and uh, John Stuart Mill, and look at their issues uh, around liberty and free speech, which I think right now is also very serious because we are having uh, demonstrations and protests. Uh, uh, we have anti-maskers who are protesting or were in Toronto. We have those kinds of protests in the, in the U.S. Uh, freedom of speech, freedom of liberty, freedom of movement. All of these things are now being uh, compromised as the state pushes back, right? Even though in the U.S. it is a constitutional right to protest and demonstrate, if you are a member of uh, of the government branch, right, of whatever the branch is, uh, judicial in this case, no, um, you don't have the right, or certainly not to the degree that individuals think they do. So liberty and free speech, again, serious aspects, serious components 
of social contract theory. In week nine, we talk about ethics of care. Uh, this is the idea proposed by Carol Gilligan in studying the differences, the moral differences between men and women. And it will follow up with, uh, are men and women morally different? Are, are they so different that, that men and women cannot even speak to each other about moral issues? Short answers, of course they can. So, but what makes men and women uh, morally different? That is still worth pursuing. Week 10, we're gonna look at uh, ethics of virtue. And this is Aristotle's idea of virtuous behavior uh, and how the midpoint between an excess and a deficiency, whatever that virtue may be, is what makes a good person, what constitutes a good citizen. Then we're gonna look at uh, issues for and against animal rights because that is again, a really good example of virtuous behavior. If you're a kind and considerate to individuals, why not extend that to animals? Uh, some people who are vegan or just don't eat meat uh, do so because of that very reason, because they wish to extend their, their kindness and consideration to non-human uh, animals. So why not? It does make sense. Week 11, we're going to look at uh, Nietzsche's master-slave morality. Uh, a very, well, Nietzsche, most people have heard of him, but not really don't know who he is. So we're going to take a look at Nietzsche's idea, a uh, very strange, very different idea of morality as one of the master or the slave. Now, briefly, again, I want to sort of set aside the notion of master and slave. It isn't slavery in the sense that we know it. What Nietzsche is talking about is mastering yourself mastering your your desires your your goals setting up a life in such a way that you can achieve the goals that you wish to to pursue uh, versus a slave who is at the mercy of their desires their their instincts uh, they blame other people they're always blaming others for their problems their mistakes and Nietzsche says no if you want to be a master you have to owe up to your mistakes and you have to overcome them so it's it's a kind of what he calls self-overcoming. So the problems that you have in your life, you need to deal with them squarely and straight on, deal with them and move on to make yourself uh, basically a master of your destiny, the best way to describe it. Then in the second half of week 11, we're gonna look at eugenics. Eugenics is the uh, scientific study of perfecting the human race. Uh, it has a horrible history. It goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks, but it really came into its own during Nazi Germany in the 1930s and 40s, where the, the Nazi party believed that uh, by getting rid of, um, well, undesirables, we'll say. And this were these were undesirables because of mental and physical disabilities. And eventually, of course, it became a, uh, a, a race like to create a, what he called a master race by getting rid of, uh, of gypsies and leftists and homosexuals and everybody else that was not considered part of the Aryan race. So eugenics is still being done today, but we're gonna look at the issues surrounding eugenics, what it was and what it presently is. Uh, week uh, 12, uh, we can look at marriage and monogamy. Uh, this is of course an institution that has lasted for a very long time. But um, are there moral and ethical issues around marriage and monogamy? Uh, uh, polyamory is, is one alternative to monogamy, which is to a man or a woman has several, several lovers or several partners, and each partner knows about the other because, again, they want to be deontological about it. They want to let the, the partners know that there are others also there. So let's look at the, the, uh, the positive and negative effects of monogamy, marriage, polyamory, and so on. And then we'll end with uh, you, the looking at terrorism and the use of torture, which are pretty heavy topics, to say the least. Uh, but by the time we get to this point, we will be able to discuss these things uh, reasonably and objectively and balance, in a balanced sort of way. But the use of terrorism to advance one's political agenda, could that be ever justified? And consequently, the state's use of torture, again, the social contract allows us or did allow the U.S. at a period in time, perhaps they still are, uh, to use torture, to, in other words, legally harm individuals to get information. So kind of scary. And then finally, week 13, the online test based on weeks 7 to 12. And again, I'm going to have a brief um, sort of review of the material for the second half. Now, what I'd like to do at this point here is go to our page uh, online, and I'm looking at this now as a student, and you should be able to see this when you first come on, a little uh, welcome uh, announcement. Now, 
when I post these videos, you will always, always see the video announced here under announcements. So if, um, if I have a new one for the, this week, I try to get them done at the beginning of the week, but look, uh, check back as late as Tuesday and the two, uh, 1A, 1B or 2A and 2B should both be posted. But this is where you'll find them. So again, instructor information, uh, my name, the office, uh, online until further notice and uh, appointments are available if you need to contact me but certainly my email is right there so if you wish to contact me that's how you do it now how do we get information here on this particular uh, uh in this area here so we have the content page i'm going to ignore this phone call uh, okay so let's say here under content we have the essay topics and instruction uh here we've got essay number one and you know, it just drives you nuts. You hear the phone, you want to pick it up, but I'm not going to. Okay, so here's the first one. Short essay topic number one. And we've got the due date, uh, the value, the length, the learning goals, uh, the learning outcomes. And then down here, we have the assignment instructions. So this is what I want you to look at when you think about a topic that you wish to write about. And if you want to come up with your own, all I ask you is please let me know. In other words, if you're going to do one of these, uh, in this case, uh, different uh, topics, the six that are there, no problem. But if you're going to pick something new, please let me know. So this is where you find your information. Uh, this is under the content page. Oops, we've gone too far. Okay, so we have down the left-hand side, uh, essay topics and instruction week one course breakdown academic uh, academic uh, expectations week two week three and all the way down here so every module you see me discussing you can see here let's say just for example um course breakdown this will be the one time when we can't get a connection the point is here you're going to be able to see the uh template all the information that is here for you to look at. And in the meantime, it's not going to be uh, linking up to it. doesn't matter. But all the information that you're looking for is always going to be there in each of the weeks, along with the little PDF of the, the points uh, that are raised. There we go. So we have course breakdown. So if you click on this, you will see the module that I just finished showing you. And here also, too, are three examples of what happens when, when someone lies. A uh, man acquitted of sexually assaulting not self, of course, but here we go. Okay. Man acquitted of sexually assaulting self-described cougar. And this is an article back in 2016. And these, for some strange reason, all came up within 24 hours. So I just basically did a cut and paste from Post Media Network. And this was a story of a woman who lied in court, basically to get back at someone. And this person could have gone to jail for the fact that someone was lying about them. So kind of kind of dangerous. Another one, a Muslim teen lied about being attacked by Trump supporters, lying to a woman charged with mischief for false claim of hit and run. So as you can see, when you lied, there can be serious repercussions either to yourself or to someone you, you are lying about. So imagine if society said, no problem, carry on. Let's have more of the same. Let's say a utilitarian said that. And that would be a frightening world to say the least. But that, let's say that happened. That would be terrifying simply because society would begin to break down. So, uh, as you can see through, throughout each one of these, you'll see the module and they are available for you to look at. Uh, the last thing I want to show you here is under, uh, quizzes and submissions. If you go to quiz, you're going to see this is the first one here. Now I've set it for today so we could see it, but it actually won't start until the end of week four. But it'll say due on October 18th, 11.59, available September 20th, of course, yesterday, until the 18th. And it shows you that you've not tried yet. But you go in and you click on here. Whoops. Click on here. And it'll give you the quiz details. And you are allowed 30 minutes. And then you click down here, start quiz, and away you go. So that is how you do the quizzes. And that's where you find them. And finally, what I want to show you is under um the what is that again under valuations submissions 
This is where you are going to submit your, your essay. Here's the first one, a uh, shorter essay due October 25th, 2020. The larger one or the longer is going to be November 29th. So when you see it, you click on it here and there's the date. Uh, this submission will be, will also be submitted to turn it in. So be careful to turn it in. Don't plagiarize because it, it will catch you. Now, if you quote from someone, I'm reading your essay anyway. I can see that. But if you're going to cut and paste from somewhere else and the thing lights up like a Christmas tree, it's zero. I'm sorry. So it has a due date, the value, the length, notes, the uh, learning outcomes, the questions that are going to be asked of you, and the expectations. So everything is there. So uh, we're running almost an hour, so 50 minutes and a little bit. But I wanted to just point all these things out to you. If you have, uh, if you need information on writing essays, uh, the Fancho on uh, library information is there. Uh, uh, Purdue Owl, uh, Purdue Owl for resources, uh, writing labs, all these things are going to be there to help you. Now, the last thing is, uh, to me, I don't care whether you write in APA or MLA format. Just be consistent. Most, uh, most students at Fanshawe will write using APA, which is their kind of the go-to or default position. I'm okay with that. I can read both. I personally prefer the Chicago style, but that's another story. So APA or MLA, but be consistent. So if I see which one you're using, as long as you're consistent, I'm fine with that. So that is essentially it. That is the first, uh, the first hour of the, uh, course breakdown, where to find information, how to contact me. Uh, and again, all the videos will always be right here under the announcement page, which I'm going to go to right now. And nope, one more. There we go. So you're going to see that right here where it says hello and welcome. This is always where you're going to find the links, which are going to be uh, available through, through YouTube. Uh, but the links will take you straight to the video for you to watch. So enough of my talking. I'm going to take a little break and have a drink of water before I come back to finish up the, uh, the next one for 1B. Uh, and we'll see you very shortly.